So, hey, everybody, I'd love to introduce Dr. Aaron Acesta from San Diego National Lab, who is, well, connect, like, connecting scientific machine learning to actual applications and making use of it. So, welcome, Aaron. Yeah, thank you, Greg. Um, so so I, I said I'd, I'd go over a couple of boilerplate things to, to get started. And, and a few of those things are first, um, I want to emphasize that I, I only put my name now on the title slide because I'm very lucky to be a part of a very large community that is interested in this type of work. And so I'll be presenting a lot of that, the aggregation of kind of how we're looking at that work. And for to give proper rec, uh, recommendations, I will have their, their papers at the bottom of those pages. Um, but this is, I'm, I'm one person who's, who's a part of a broader community of practice. Um, and so for that reason, at times, I may not be the, the right person to go into the specific details, but I'll be more than happy to get those details if you have the question, any questions that I can't answer directly. So those are some of my caveats up front. The other one is, um, it sounds like I don't have to worry about the dog being a little crazy at home because filters have gotten really good, but I'll just keep talking regardless of what happens on my end. Please feel free to interject. So with that, as I'm presenting, I like for these to be an engaging, open, dynamic conversation. And hopefully you'll see why, because there's a lot of work that has to be done in these areas. And I like to hear what other, how other people are thinking about this so we can develop and grow and, and broaden that, that network of interest in that community of practice. So with that, I'm going to jump into first, because I always forget to get my laser pointer ready so you guys can see. Um, then I'm going to go into this motivation page. Uh, I do this now because we will be talking about epidemiology. But with a broader, a broader audience, I like to emphasize that as a, as a mathematician at Sandia, um, a lot of the priorities that we look at, the kind of motivation, the perspective that I have is going to come from a deep history and perspective on how the National Nuclear Security Administration labs approach modeling for high consequence environments, right? And so the reason why we tackle these problems in this way is because we have to strike that balance between leveraging the advantages of machine learning and all of the great opportunities um, that these new, novel, unique applications are offering to solutions for our application spaces while ensuring that responsible use for national security purposes. So I just like to hit pause and emphasize, right? We are a multi-mission lab. We work in a large range of different domain areas. Um, but at the end of the day, what we do, one of the big key areas we work in, and we have a deep bench in history and is in that credibility assessment and analysis. So let's talk about what that, first, what, what are the shoulders we're standing on, right? Like what are the methods that already exist for classic computational simulation models? Now, before I dive into those details, I'd like to first emphasize what is credibility, right? Um, I like to start here and emphasize that, you know, without a formal definition, it can be really right, quite subjective. And this is probably my first, um, my favorite explanation, right? I mean, we need to roll it out. It's got to be credible. Of course it is, right? Um, but then there's a lot of other ones that are very reasonable assessments, right? You have 50 years of experience on the team. You're using the highest fidelity simulations. You put in the most conservative margins. And obviously, we have a lot of history of how this is done, and we continue to do it this way, right? All of these assertions provide some aspect of credibility, but yet they can't stand alone as a full evidence package that is reproducible and consistent for our decision makers as we roll out methodologies for high consequence environments. So what we have at Sandia and what has been developed, um, so sorry, excuse me, I get excited and I jump. First, I wanna make sure we're on the same page because when we talk about verification and validation, um, there are a couple of different standards out there. So I like to first benchmark and make sure we're all on the same page. When I see verification, um, we have these like easy, just quick questions that we're trying to answer when we're looking at these type of analyses. And verifications are we solving the equations correctly. So this gets broken down into two components, code verification and solution verification, because in different aspects, when we ask a computational simulation modeler to represent some phenomenon or, or analysis or inference, we get the computer science side of things and we get the numerical analysis side of things, right? So we, we want to know, are there bugs in the code? And if they are, can we find them? Can we, can we correct for these? And we also want to know what numerical errors exist. Whatever 
whatever analysis that we're running, um, the computer is always as good as being linear and finite. And so we always have to take some approximation. The problem we ask the computer to solve is rarely ever the problem I would ever solve directly with pen and paper. Validation asks the question, are we solving the right equations? So this is when we bring in experimental data as our ground truth, and we compare the model's predictions to, to that data that we have in a representative way. And then, of course, uncertainty quantification. So how large is the uncertainty of the results? So can we measure that, that range of prediction uncertainty? And we're going to see, I'll get into this one a little bit more, that this is an aggregation of a lot of sources of uncertainty that can happen. But one of the biggest, one of the key principles when it comes to credibility is we want to be able to know, can we partition epistemic from aleatory? So epistemic is our reducible uncertainty, right? So this is just the aspect of the fact that we have a lack of knowledge. We don't have representative data for that regime. And so ideally, we could reduce that uncertainty if we collect more information, we collect more data. Aleatory uncertainty is the irreducible uncertainty. This is when the uncertainty that is characterized by the fact that our world is just random by nature. And so there's not much that you can do to, to pull that out. So how do we collect all this information at Sandia? So in that reproducible, consistent, consistent way. So what we use is called the Predictive Capability Maturity Model, or PCMM for short. Um, this is a way to collect evidence in the planning process of the modeling and development phases. We highly encourage, I know these are considered outer loop analysis and, and tend to be tacked on at the end of the development. I'm going to start with saying right now it's in everybody's best interest if you integrate it throughout, right? Because then you find opportunities for the development team to, to um, refine or correct uh, potential errors or estimations early on in that, in that development phase. The key here is we put it in a wheel for a very specific reason, and that is because the evidence you're going to collect is very specific to the application context that you are prioritizing for the, the model development. So our, our baseline that we are building off of as we get into the discussion for scientific machine learning, and then I'll get into the discussion about how it's applied for epidemiology, is that there is a very specific application context that most of our principles fall under, and that is partial differential equations for computational fluid dynamics, right? So these elements are specific to that modeling paradigm, and then the evidence you would want to collect to help communicate to a decision maker how plausible a prediction is or the limitations of the model under different uh, conditions can be, can be collected, right? And so, what does that evidence look like to give you something a little concrete to, to better understand as we work through the elements across our wheel here? And so the first one here, remember, it's partial, um, partial differential equations for computational fluid dynamics. So representation and geometric fidelity. So as we get into the system, full system scale type of uh, models and analysis, we might have a design that really would have this rounded elongated edges, but computationally, it's gonna be easier to just assume a right angle, right? So this is what we mean about geometric fidelity. We're introducing errors right off the bat because the design is slightly different than what, it, what we need to do for modeling. The physics, we have what's called PERT, the Phenomenon Identification Ranking Tool. And so this is actually a qualitative um, communication tool between the modeler, the analyst, the decision maker, subject matter expertise, where you identify the key phenomenon that's essential to be captured in the model. You determine how important it is, whether or not we know the mathematical model, do we have a computational model, is it can it be validated, are we gonna be able to get the experiments for it? And you're, you're doing this planning process up front. Code verification uh, or soft and or software quality assurance. You're going through a type of unit test, integration tests. Um, can we identify when there's bugs in, in the code? And kind of that comprehensive um, analysis of the software itself that's going to be running the, the model. Solution verification is analogous to numerical analysis, right? So this is the grid refinement studies. Um, and in our contest, or this can come in with the human errors. How do you choose? to partition your space to provide the approximations and potential interpolations between the points in which 
you've allowed your, your system to be meshed across and what type of errors are introduced with that. Validation is again that comparison to data. So now you have an experiment, an experiment that's been run, you do direct comparison to that data with your model simulation, and that's the validation studies. You can also find that you're going to have errors there as well, and we'll get into some more of that later. And then, of course, uncertainty quantification, right? All of this, we, we have all these opportunities in which we're approximating the real world throughout these elements. We identify what they are, and we try to get that properly measured and aggregated into those prediction uncertainties. If you can pull out epistemic from aleatory and you can drive that down and collect more information and collect more data, again, the wheel, rinse and repeat, keep going, reiterate around it, right? So those are the elements, though. What's really interesting about the maturity models, and these date back to um, really the original maturity model was developed by Carnegie Mellon Software Engineering Institute. And they did this for the DOD. They developed methods for the DOD to determine when software can be trusted in high consequence environments and really where the PCMM process for, for computational models has, has been derived off of. But as we talk about the elements, each element, I'm just going to do UQ right now. Um, it's one of the most successful ones and for a broad audience, the one that I think people are most familiar with. I'm only going to talk about UQ so I can go through the levels. You can see there's four levels here, and the way we define a level is from low to high consequence that the model is intended to be used, and to what degree is that model the only source of information. So if you come up here, you're thinking very high consequence, the model is going to make the decision, the decision is going to be executed, so autonomous systems of some sort, right? These are the activities you would expect under uncertainty quantification that have been executed and that you can trust the uncertainties and the sensitivity analysis around, around that model that's going to be making a, a prediction and executing on it independent of any other influence. Most of the time we find ourselves somewhere else in between, right? Um, a lot of times our models are coming in as a piece of the puzzle for a decision maker. So it's, it's being aggregated with other sources of information. And so we wouldn't be fully level three at that point. You'd be targeting level two. The goal here is to help modelers and designers determine what is the elements, where do you want to prioritize your resources, your energy, right? There's always a right sizing for how the model is going to be used. You don't have to run through all of the analysis all the time. Credibility is really an unending game because everything we do is an approximation of the real world. And so this helps organize what you want to prioritize for, for your model based on its use case. So question, how do you yeah, know please. Whether, um, how much to you trust your UQ? I should believe that assumptions thing because the easiest way to apply UQ is you get sensitivity of the results accuracy on the parameters of the simulation. But for the most part, it's more like, do I have the right equations? Do I have the right job? Mm -hmm. These things, especially for epidemiology where you know, you don't know a lot of the stuff. Mm -hmm. so how, do you, how do you evaluate over all the unknown or poorly specified assumptions or know that you haven't? So that's great. Um, there is, I'm, I'm, I don't have uh, a direct answer, like the easy, like here's the cutoff and knowing, right? Of course. Um, that is one of the grand challenge problems. And one in which there's like a large community always trying to understand how do you pull in these other other sources. And I think it'll be interesting. Um, and maybe we can we can re-raise re it in a little bit when we get into mm -hmm. the epidemiology example, because we do start to tease out those things, um, especially in epidemiology. And so, we can get into kind of all the sources of uncertainty that come into come into our challenges, into our problems, and and how we're trying to address those. Um, but it is a, it's an active research area, right? On knowing the parameter uncertainty is important, but from the very beginning, you have already decided that the model form. This is the model. This is what you're going to use, and you're looking at how the parameter uncertainty is affecting the output, right? But you haven't looked at the model form uncertainty yet. You haven't captured the numerical uncertainties, right? And so we can we can start uh, picking that apart more more specifically in a little bit. Yeah. yeah thank Thanks, Greg. So one of the other points I want to make, and I said this earlier, but we we also kind of pull apart our our cycle here and and overlay it um, with the development process to further emphasize. Right. This is. This analysis, the VVUQ analysis you'd want to do and all the elements that are associated to that is something that really should be 
you know, figure out once you know what the requirements are for the application, start thinking about with your, your modeling strategy, what are their credibility strategies, right? Start doing that in tandem because you really do find opportunities to, to find um, errors, estimations, corrections, uncertainties um, as you're doing the development, which is going to save you time as opposed to turning around and trying to correct later. But one of the emphasis we want to put in here, because we do see uncertainty quantification, having error bars is, is essential for providing a source of, of credibility, right? But it's not enough. Um, it is the one thing that's most visibly aware that, that it exists in your model, but the rest of it is really that technical basis. And uncertainty quantification, while essential, doesn't tell us whether or not we're solving everything you just said, Greg. I, th I think I have it listed here and you just asked it, right? Um, <laughs> so having these other elements in mind and working through them through that process is, is important to, to really even understanding the credibility of your uncertainty quantification. All right, so I'm going to pause for a second because that was a 15 minute summary of what is really like decades worth of work and research and, and uh, a summary. But are there any questions before I start talking about how we're adapting it? No? Oh, cool. So as we start talking about adapting, um, the credibility process for scientific machine learning, uh, we have to talk about what we mean about scientific machine learning. And I can only tell you what I mean when I say SciML. And, and I do understand that it's, it's more broadly defined in the community of practice, more so than how I would define it. But very loosely, this is when machine learned models are used in lieu of to complement or as a surrogate for us, classic computational simulation models, right? I have three examples here. Well, three classes of examples, really, right? The community is moving much closer to operator learning, but this started from physics-informed neural networks, where you have a known system of partial differential equations, and you're using a neural network because those are those PDEs are really hard to solve, and so you're using the neural network to find the solution to that to that differential equation. Another class of, of problems is system identification. Well, machine learning. So, excuse me, neural ordinary differential equations. This is really a machine learning approach to system identification. And system identification is not new. Statisticians have been doing this for decades. We're just now using machine learning models to find those approximations to the dynamics without any assumptions about what those dynamics are the in the differential space. And then model form error corrections. These are um, one of the areas is called universal differential equations. And this is where we keep the dynamics we know we trust we love. Um, and we just use the neural network to learn that model form error correction. And so we're not fully neural ODEs, we're this hybrid approach to differential equations and their representation. So let's go back to this um, maturity model wheel and those elements, and I'm gonna step through that. So before we were talking about geometric fidelity, and I'm gonna say here first before I I continue is that um, when we're doing hybrid methods, I'm not talking about the classic differential equation side of things. I'm talking about the machine learning piece now, just like when I bring in that machine learning part to it. So if I replace my um, PDE application for computational fluid dynamics, some of the things we started re rethinking is we want to replace geometric fidelity with data representation, right? The credibility of any machine learning model is predicated on the data that was used to train it. So how do I know I trust the data that, that's going to learn this component? Before, we always talked about the physics models because we were always talking about physics. But once we're, we're more broadly talking about scientific machine learning, we want to adopt to the, the language that the community uses and say just domain aware. So the machine learning model is, is brought, applied more broadly. So we just have shifted. Um, what does it mean to be domain aware when you're using machine learning models? Solution and code verification, we have put into one element and we've removed verification because with the machine learned piece, machine learning model piece, we are not starting with equations. So we can't really talk about are we solving the equations correctly? And we want to avoid um, conflating that information with the community of practice that does deep research in verification for PDE's classic, classic models. 
So we've moved to say we still need it, and we're using evaluation right now as we start to adapt what it means for machine learning, which also opens up an element in a category. Um, not that we have to stay to the six, but it did open up, uh, makes it easy for me to present. Uh, we'll throw in interpretability and explainability. This is how the machine learning community is trying to build trust in, in these models. And um, at the same time, though, some of those methods can be heuristic, uh, heuristic of a heuristic. And so we should look at the levels of maturity of these methods alongside. They're very useful, very informative, and we need to know how that complements the, the use of the machine learning model. Uncertainty quantification, validation, these are core areas of research that really align already with the way that we already think about EQ. And I mean, there's other aspects of work that needs to be done. But you can see that we, we don't really want to change those elements. We just need to figure out how we approach it for machine learning. Okay, so that's the foundation of credibility. That's how we're thinking about um, adapting those elements, working towards a maturity model. So let's dig into an example. So we're going to talk about how we're using CIML for epidemiology. Before I do that, I just want to get a very the basics out of the way, um, make sure we're all on the same page about these compartmental models, where I'm going to start with, but I'm not going to stick to just the compartmental models. But here I have a simple system of ODEs, your classic SIR model. On the right, I'm showing that as the, the simple flow diagram that we tend to use a lot, so it's easy and uh, kind of how the, the model and the dynamics are, are transitioning. In here, lambda of T is the rate in which the susceptible population gets infected. That is called the force of infection function. And the most simplest way to represent that is beta, your rate of infection, with the proportion of the population that is infectious at time T. So this is actually a quadratic term in your differential equations. And then gamma, the inverse of gamma, is the mean duration of infectiousness in this model. Now, the minute we have multiple um, rates out of my infectious population, it will no longer mean that anymore. That's a different conversation, but I like to caveat this, this statement with that. So this is what um, a notional example of what the solution can look like, right? And right here, the star, some of the properties that we like to hold on to for SIR models, and I'd like to clarify is that the secondary infection rate is treated as a scalar value, and I can pull that out of the model representation. And so if you're going to do the mathematical um, analysis of the system of ODEs, R not the symbolic representation of this is actually going to come from the bifurcation of your system. And so we can mathematically derive what the model R not is, but R not is assumed to be a scalar, a scalar value. We know that the secondary rate of infection changes over time, and that has a different interpretation. This is the effective reproductive number. So this it becomes uh, a time varying rate of secondary infections, and it is essentially going to be R not times the proportion of the population that's still susceptible. So that's why we see this peak. Herd immunity is hit, and so that I sent, I'm gonna come over here, that R effective is one. Right, so my susceptible population has become the inverse of R naught. And when we talk about and we want to reach herd immunity, we're actually looking for one minus the inverse of R naught in this very simple representation from the compartmental model um, for classic infectious disease modeling. But it's very clear that that's underrepresentative of the real world phenomenon that we're trying to represent, right? So we can't capture all the peaks and curves. I mean, we can try, we can encode a lot more compartments, but we're just gonna make a much more complicated model and, and there's better ways to do that. So what this model has then is large model form error. This slide is one that I wanna, I, wanna, I like to use to make sure we're all on the same page. So we talk about model form error, we talk about model discrepancy, we talk about model form uncertainty. Um, these are terms that get conflated a lot. And so I, I just have a little cartoon that kind of steps through um, how we've adopted the way that uh, Maha Davin's group at Vanderbilt has, has defined these, this terminology. So let's start with the fact that you have a notional ground truth model. So what I did here is we just have a dynamical system and I'm going to assume that I know the behavior of X of T, but I don't, I'm not gonna know exactly how to represent Z, Z of T. 
So what do we do? We end up taking Z tilde. I take an approximation. I know something needs to be there, but I don't have a physical law for its principle to represent it. And so I put in some approximation that helps me try to, to figure out what, what's going on there. This allows me to write model form error. It is the difference. It is the difference between what we should have modeled and what we actually modeled. And if I could mathematically represent that, that's how I would represent that in a very simple, accessible way for, for a broad community. So model form error is the missing equations or the misrepresentation of equations in the model itself. Now, the key here is though, we did put something in, we have an initial value problem that's going to have a solution, right? So here, the green dashed line is my model. I have data that I'm trying to get that model to fit to, right? And so maybe I'm trying to run calibration, no matter how hard I calibrate it, what I see on the trend in the data is that there's kind of two peaks there. If I, I try to just, if I filter closely, right? And I, I, I decide that there's two peaks that really should be found, but my model's quadratic, it's never gonna find those two peaks. That is the model discrepancy. The comparison of the data to a model, the comparison of the data to a trend, that's a residual. The discrepancy is the difference between the model and the true nature of the, the trend in the data. No matter how hard I try to calibrate, I'm not gonna be able to get it to fit what's going on. So we talk about model form errors, the missing equations, the misrepresentation equations, the discrepancy is no matter how well I can calibrate, it's the difference between the model's prediction and the data I have available. Now, back to Greg's point earlier, right? There's a lot of sources of uncertainty. If we are able to actually capture and properly measure and aggregate that, we should be able to get this, this range of prediction uncertainty that is dependent on model form error, the parameters that we're used to being able to measure and run, the data. The data has its own kind of nuances. A sensor doesn't read perfectly every time. Epidemiology is not reported consistently, right? Um, and then there's the numerical errors. I have a, I have a numerical system that's going to solve um, something that's probably very complex and I'm not gonna solve that perfectly every time. So there's all these sources of uncertainty that are, that are at play. We don't always measure all of them, but we'd like to get to a place where we can to have a better prediction uncertainty for our models. So question about the data, because yeah. at least in this slide, you're treating data as uh, truth. But the data, let's say, actually, if you tell me, I mean, oh, the yeah. analogy is perfect because the data is biased. It comes from a set yeah. of bias distribution that's, in this case, determined by politics of which interventions are rolled out, which are hard, yeah. which are mm -hmm. you know, random examples. Um, how does that <laughs> modulate the story? Oh, goodness. Okay, so this that's a great question. I wish I put that slide in here and I don't have it right now. Um, so especially with um, a phenomenon that is inherently a stochastic process, like the evolution of, of disease transmission, right, within a population. And so one thing that we have to be careful of is every stochastic process, if it's a stochastic dynamical system, is once it's being realized, it is, it's not going to deviate drastically unless you have jump diffusion in there, right? So it's not going to move away from that trend that you're seeing. Um, like right here, right? But if I was if I was to be able to collect a lot of ensembles of these trends for to really get the true nature of the uncertainty of this bias that exists in this realization. So this is how I'm interpreting your bias, Greg. I hope that's okay. The bias in the realization you are observing is a bias away from a mean of the true underlying stochastic process. We have a really hard time of really characterizing what the true underlying process is unless you can capture a lot of realizations as if you're to run you know a thousand replicates of an sde we can get those beautiful bounds but in the real world that's a lot of data to collect to really understand the underlying stochastic process and its variance right but we do know that every realization has its own bias because very rarely will actually be at the mean or median behavior right so we do have a colleague at sandia that um, has worked on and incorporated the awareness that a inherently stochastic process evolutionary system will have a bias in the realization of the data. Um, so Darby Smith is, is one that I think of right now. Um, 
who knows how to incorporate that uncertainty in the prediction uncertainty. And that's not one that I've, I mean, data will have all of this, right? But even the data has some complexities beyond what we're used to measuring. So let me, so uh, you focus so far on the data set is um, unbiased sample and you have to, because it's so complicated, you have to have many mm -hmm. samples just to mean. Now, mm -hmm. let me point in a different direction, which is if the data set is a biased sample. So in the epidemiology is that the realizations, mm -hmm. oh, let me, something much simpler. You wanna figure oh, yeah, out yeah. Uh, the impact of a, of a surgery on a person. You, what you want to do is pull random people off the street, give them surgery and see what happens. But your yeah, mentality yeah. is a population that's highly biased, sick people. You give them mm -hmm. surgery, most of them die. Would mm -hmm. more of them have died if you didn't give them the surgery is the question. So your data set is biased because, well, you only got sick people, not random people off the street. Right, yeah. So I think that's fair. I mean, you went to um, surgery, right? But I, let me see if I'm following. So that would be analogous to even just saying, um, for the most part, we can't do uniform testing either to know who our, our cases are. So that if there is an asymptomatic population, are we are undersampling the representation of how many people could potentially be spreading the disease based on who actually get tested versus who don't get tested and think they just have like with COVID, they just think they had um, allergies, right? So there's a bias inherent to that data, and so. I, oh, and the other one is uh, policy. Yeah. The, the local policymakers change mm -hmm. the rules of the of the infection in ways that, you, that are not in your data set, and they do so in response to external pressure like well, politics yeah so um those are all areas in which you know if you can get um some experimental evidence of any sort that can give you a sense of the scale of that bias ideally we would want to be able to incorporate that that scale in the predictions of course um i'm not going to touch on that one specifically today unfortunately but um, there are ways, and it is, I mean, and then, then you have to worry a little bit, though, because at times, unless you have the scientific evidence that says this is the bias, especially with the things that we were just talking about, um, you know, especially policy or getting, you know, knowing the asymptomatic versus your, your susceptible population, right, the truly, like, the, the large population of, of infectious, in that case, now you you got to trade off your decision to accept that this is an underestimation because you're not going to inject that bias versus the developer's bias that's going to come in because they choose to determine how to scale that, how to model that bias. They're going to inject their own bias into it as well. And so you got to decide what the right way is to weigh that. And when we go to the credibility evidence, how do you communicate? That, that bias exists already right up front and or did you choose to correct for it and how did you choose to correct for it and just be very clear because at the end of the day these bias how we measure that how we model it is is another very complicated problem and we just need to be clear and honest about when it exists and whether or not we handled it and if we handled it how did we handle it yeah that makes a lot of sense thank you yeah yeah All right, let's see, where am I? We're still doing okay, too. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because um, my understanding is CRISPR caucus did present back in April. And so if you want to hear about the details about universal differential equations, you can go to his paper and or watch the, the YouTube stream that, that exists um, already and see the state of the art of universal differential equations. We just motivate this, and I'm just going to emphasize here UDEs allow us to preserve the dynamics we know, we trust, we love. We just know under represent the real world. And so we only use the neural network to do that correction term versus a neural ODE that says, okay, data, tell me what's going on. For epidemiology, that can matter. And this is just a quick comparison between the two. If I have data going up to day 40, all I'm seeing is that exponential growth, the transition to linear behavior, but I do not have the quadratic behavior in there for the neural network to learn for a neural ODE. I encoded it though, and I'll show you, we encode it in a UDE though. That quadratic behavior exists. So all the UDE is doing is it's letting the data tell it what face portrait it exists on. And the rest of the dynamics is helping it determine that extrapolation space.
So you can be more extrapolative if you preserve the fundamental phenomenology you know about the dynamics and only use the neural network for the correction. So that's what we decided to do. Here are the details for a very simple example. We do this intentionally. I want to emphasize what we might talk about COVID to baseline the practical application and the discussion of what we're framing these kinds of conversations around. This model is not meant to represent COVID. This is as simple of a model as we can get to so that we can do the exploratory analysis of why we would trust this neural network correction term. So if we take to that simple SIR model, oh, I said that in the next slide, I might have to correct myself, but that's okay. So we take SIR, susceptible infectious recovered. I know at a minimum, it doesn't represent quarantine. And that is the first line of defense. We don't have therapeutic interventions. The first thing to do is to get people off the street if you know that they're infectious, to remove them from spreading. What that does effectively in the dynamical system is it reduces mean duration of infectiousness. Is what it's actually doing for this compartmental model. So if I remove somebody from, they are technically still infectious, right? But they're not spreading and that's all I really care about in the dynamics. So we're looking at how long are you spreading the infection in these dynamics? So if you're out in the wild and it's 10 days, it's 10 days, that's what we model. Now, if we have quarantine, we pull you in three days, that affects the secondary infection rate. So we want to know how we want to pull people out, but we don't know how to mechanistically divine that rate of change. And so we allow this neural network to be that universal approximator to that nonlinear function in the differential equations. So for those that are familiar with optimal control theory, the problem formulation is very similar. So instead of having an objective function with the aggregated control profile, we look at the loss function is going to drive down the residuals, prioritizing the minimization, prioritizing the optimization on the parameters of the neural network and the base disease parameters. So we're doing calibration while learning model form error. And we're doing this to drive down the residuals between the data I have for the observable states and the solution to the differential equation that I have at time t, or not time t, but for that, um, for that epoch that run of full run of epoch and then we update and we rerun so what this does here's some more details um, we do use a very simple model we can use a very simple neural network because we have encoded other information and we're learning both of the parameters ode and neural network and we use all the libraries out of the julia siml ecosystem so what's really impressive and I like to joke. So this is the one time I'll say this model was used for COVID. And that's where I'm going to correct my earlier statement briefly. And that is in the midst of the pandemic, our collaborators at MIT dove right in and said, hey, we have this tool. It's really effective. Let's see if it'll work to help give policy or an awareness of, of what's going on around the world. So while, while we were working really hard back in New Mexico, um, partnering with uh, the Department of Health, and understanding the constraints and impacts on our contact tracers to reach out to people and really getting in that complex resource constrained, dynamically informed transmission rate in there. Our, our friends at MIT were getting a relative sense around the world very quickly. Now to be fair, quarantine was not the only thing that was happening, but it's the only thing being put in this model. For COVID, this model is missing the exposure population which, which would actually, it's, it's required if you have an incubation period for an infectious disease that you do capture that delay between being in, infected and then becoming infectious yourself. Um, but in this context, so there's still this, there's still an error associated like, to the model that's being represented, but we can in a relative sense, at least very quickly, if we know where we're missing information get these forecasts that are that are trend specific for different regions because every region is different based on their policies and you know how dense it is and, and others all these other complexities that are embedded in it now before i go to the next slide i always point to spain i'm not even going to conjecture what the heck was going on in spain that week but i feel like you guys have can probably come up with your own um so something happened there's a blip here right Technically, I should be able to have a neural network approximate and capture. If I really wanted to overfit and capture that blip, we could get there. We don't want to overfit usually, but finding the right way to, to capture this, there's a huge gap that happens after it. 
Some of this can be attributed to the fact that while the universal approximation theorem is a, is a necessary condition for neural networks to be function approximators, in practice it is not sufficient. So for those that don't know it, I'll just briefly summarize that the uh, universal approximation theorem says that if you have a non-polynomial activation function, and if you fix the number of weights on each layer and you have sufficient layers, or you fix the number of layers and you have sufficient weights, a neural network is, can be a universal approximator to any continuous function. Now that is true, and we find all the time that knowing what the right architecture is a priori for a complex function you're learning that you don't know is a really hard problem. So having the right architecture for that function is a practical challenge that we have, and this falls into something analogous to our verification our numerical errors. I have a numerical structure. I have, an, um, I have a numerical implementation error potentially attributed to the structure I chose for the neural network. So this is actually excellent and justice because ultimately you are, let me think like classic science. I, we are Newton right now. Don't quite understand the mechanics and I come up with a bunch of formulas that happen to work. You have some hypotheses about how this works. You chose to say SAR plus neural mm -hmm. network. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess, how do you approach this? I know something, I don't know the rest of it, and I make this mishmash of learn and structure. Yeah, so it, right now that is, that is large, that is very much a, a skill um, that is learned over time based and be having a domain expert involved. Absolutely, you have to have a domain expert involved for that application area, right? If it's climate, you should have a climate expert who really knows those dynamics. Uh, epidemiology, the epidemiology expert, and so on, right? Newton, uh, well, sorry, solid mechanics, you're gonna want that solid mechanics expert to try to figure out how to balance those things. Because right now we don't have, we don't have a good theoretical footing or grounding on what that balance looks like. It'd be ideal, I'd love to see that happen one day, right? Where we, this is how much physics you preserve, and this is how much you allow to be data, data informed. And this is how you characterize that data representation. But today, right now, we're, we're learning, we're building, we're flushing those details out. So then let me ask you the flip side of it. So the, the previous question was how much do you trust or use uh, domain experts? Now, how much do you mm -hmm. distrust them? Uh, because to a certain extent, they are a representation, a conversational representation of a, a mm -hmm. century of experiments. Yeah. To what extent can it, those experiments in some form replace symbolic understanding of physics. So I'm going to answer that by saying that that is a really important question that we need to keep at the forefront because there's on both ends our ability. So actually, I'm going to answer this this way. And I'm going to say that um, one of the biggest things that we need to be careful about is what we actually think we know um, and really question it quite regularly, especially when we have new tools, new exploratory methods and, and dig in. And if it doesn't match the historical knowledge we have, go back to those first principles because our historical knowledge, everything we do is based on first principles or axioms of choice or right the amount of truly objective facts we have in front of us even especially as modelers, it can really be quite rare, right? And then the ability to run an experiment that's gonna be a perfect representation and consistent without other environmental factors is also a hard, challenging problem. So I think our job, and I think what everybody on this call probably already does, is consistently question that and keep questioning that and recognize when it doesn't match, can we really like back engineer that to what is the assumption that allowed this deviation where I'm getting one answer from one method and another answer from another method, right? And then we, we, we grow collectively as a community when we do that, when we take the time to dive back in because everything is based on the initial assumptions and the environment in which we ran the analysis. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. How are we doing? I'm really enjoying this conversation, but I'm also probably not going to get through everything. <laughs> so let's see. I'm going to I'm going to try to run through this one a little bit quicker. Um, and and if there's questions, we can always we can always still hit pause. That's fine. So one of the things we wanted to do 
right off the bat, right? So that initial analysis I showed you took a simple SIR model, and there was an assumption that there was data available for two of the three states. The third state, we don't ever, um, we'll never get susceptible population data anyways. But what happens, and we know in our community, our models are far more complex, right? They're really large, uh, large state space, and we don't have data to represent all states. So can we run an experiment to understand that the lack of observable data can affect the recovery of useful information for that um, Q of T, which represents my quarantine rate, and the corresponding disease dynamics. So what we did, we did fully experimental here, right? We synthetically generated data based on a pre-specified neural network that had nonlinear behaviors and nominal parameter values. So we had ground truth. We then went back and used that as our ground truth, but then we went back and we looked and said, okay, what if I only have data for a subset of states? And we looked at that full space, combinatorial space on the subsets of, of the observable states. And then we can compare, because we had the ground truth, what the approximation was for that quarantine rate to what I experimentally generated. So we could start to look for the evidence we'd want to look for when we are working with more complex systems. So the basics of this approach, we already know that we're going to run through each one of these. So for each combination of states for observable data, we initialize the parameters using a sample distribution from the literature for the, the baseline disease dynamics. And then we took a, a very simple GLORAT initialization for the neural networks. We run 100 training replicates so that we can get an ensemble of solutions. This was essential because we know that neural networks have a lot of local minima and uh, optimization is very sensitive and can get stuck in, in the wrong one. Um, so one of the things we have to do is take that ensemble and we're going to have to to cut out the tails of a variability of behavior that are not reflective of the mean results that we get. This gives you um, an illustration, an example for those, the dashed line is gonna be the ones that were, were cut based on just standard statistical thresholds or standard deviations away from the mean, right? Um, we pulled things out because they were biasing our, our results. So what happens when everything goes great? Well, if you have all three states, you expect everything to go really well. So in this context, what we have here for Q of T is we have in the blue, um, we're going to have all of those just, you know, shy of 100 realizations for that quarantine rate in the differential space. I have my ground truth in orange, and then I take the mean behavior. And my mean behavior across the ensemble matches my ground truth. Um, any one ensemble is not going to, one realization from the ensemble is not going to match the ground truth perfectly, as you can see by all the jagged nuances that occurred with this, this neural network training. But in the mean, we, we can capture that. What's interesting, though, is this is still the entire ensemble of solutions. So it doesn't matter which one you grabbed. You, you can grab something that is useful information for, for the dynamics. And then for each model form error correction, you have a new model form, right? So every one of those Q of T that was learned in the ensemble has a different slight perturbation of the beta, gamma um, parameters, disease parameters. So the right parameterization that matches the model form error correction based on the data that's available allows me to capture to some degree some uncertainty about what beta and, and my two gammas are in this context. So I'm going to highlight here what we see here, and, and I want to reemphasize, we are learning model form error correction in the differential space. The neural network can have this wide range of, of variability in, on, a, on a completely different scale, on a completely different function space than my solution space. This, this is observable, and again, I did plot all just shy of 100 replicates after we cut out the outliers, we still have this trend. There's just this fuzz that kind of occurs at the peak. It's having a hard time understanding the peak, which makes sense. That's the most critical part. When is that bending, right? What happens when things go bad? So to be fair, I don't think anybody on this call would assume that a terminal state and only having data on a terminal state for a compartmental model is, is enough information. This is only meant to illustrate, and we want to see what, what happens when we expect things to go really wrong, right? So we only have data to train the neural networks on our, our recovery population. This looks perfect, 
you just look at that loss function, you're going to have something that's perfect. If you don't run an ensemble, you're going to think you're doing something good, especially when you don't have ground truth. Run the ensemble so you can just see the wide range of variability that, that is inherent to the potential solutions. Because there's so many different ways to get to that same recovery curve with a complex, when you're allowing for model form error correction and a shifting of the parameters, there's an infinite number of ways to get there. And so you'll see that if you also um, look at the uncertainty of the range of solutions. The other thing is, is quickly, right, to anybody who does, does dynamical systems analysis, we see that there's a bifurcation. We have solutions across two different planes that are happening in the, that phase portrait. So this gives you some indication of, of when and how you can tell that things are going wrong when you don't have that ground truth and you really are trying to learn a known unknown. Okay, so another thing we've done, and this one I'm really gonna, I'm gonna go really fast through because um, the Bayesian UDE studies that we did, and I'm careful not to say that it is a true fully Bayesian calibration just yet because there's so many complexities to it. Some of the things we did, we started right off the bat and said, okay, there's so much uncertainty here. We really want to capture that model form uncertainty. So to do this, we want to do the calibration in a Bayesian context. We are going to allow our priors to be uninformative, uh, wide ranges. The truth here is we probably should have taken one. This was something that was captured a little later than the analysis does. And I, I just want to make sure that that is accurately representative of what the results were reflected from. But we don't, we have wildly uninformative priors on our neural networks, on our diseases, on our disease parameters. And the likelihood is uses a, a stationary signal, right? Um, we're going to use synthetic data again from, and we're going to calibrate up to the first 50 days. And then we're going to see how well things, the likelihood assumes the following errors where we have a stationary signal. So the thing that I want to point out here is just how important defined this is, right? Um, we have parameters that what we're actually optimizing is in orange. It's the weights and the biases of the neural network. It's our baseline disease parameters. But my target is that model form error correction, right? So I'm trying to find this model form error correction and the right parameters that match it. But to do that, I'm, I'm fixing the architecture and allowing the weights and the biases to vary. So this, we have a lot of challenges. I'm, I'm going to skip this right now because it's most obvious right here. And I, anybody who does Bayesian um, knows that this is an overparameterized, really hard problem to solve. There's uh, identifiability issues everywhere, but those that aren't familiar, the we grab five, excuse me, six of the um, neural network parameters at random just to show that there's there's high correlations. This is the entire 54 parameter correlation matrix. So we can see that there's extreme correlations in our parameters. Bayesian calibration is just going to to struggle with this. Um, and so we have to do some sparsity inducing methods. We have to really kind of rethink um, what is the prioritization of the parameters? Can we get the functional relationships and only focus on one parameter over another? These are things we're still working out. But what I really want to get to is this forecasting validation study. Um, so we were able to start getting some of this analysis in the solution space. Things do tend to smooth out, like we've already seen. So we want to, if we're going to determine that we validate what we're learning, we, we jump into this space over here. And so the validation, we looked at a couple of different metrics. Um, when you look at validation in general, the metrics look at how well does my model represent history? And one of the greater challenges is we have is how well do I trust the model represents the future? So we want to know what are the right validation metrics for, for prediction forecasting. I'll come back to these if people want to know more about these metrics. Um, but the thing that, that I really want to emphasize is with our Bayesian methods, we tend to utilize and lean into the stationary likelihood. And that is not true for a stochastic system. Likelihoods for stochastic systems follow a stochastic process. The size of the noise is going to be proportional to the state at that time of t, right? I don't expect to see 100 misreported case counts if I only have 10 infected people. If I have 10,000 infected people, 100 seems small for noise, right? So my noise on misreporting is going to follow 
and the magnitude of the noise is going to grow as my infectious population gets bigger and it'll start going smaller when that infectious population also gets smaller. So we need a stochastic process or potentially a likelihood free approach to these methods. And we're exploring those currently on, on other projects and tracks. So I'll fill this in to emphasize, let's see, we'll marathon it to the end real quick here. I feel like I've, I've identified and, and articulated that, right? We've already started with a baseline ODD that we knew was not credible. It had under misrepresented, upper, underrepresented the, the dynamics that was going on. We brought in a neural network. That neural network is useful and it brought its own can of worms for credibility. What is the verification challenges? What are our validation challenges? What is the uncertainty challenges? I added more parameters. I am exploding that space and our ability to measure all those impacts on our prediction uncertainties. So while that's true, one thing, and I'll, I'm just going to summarize here, is one thing that we've decided is against the real world, yes. Um, we have a lot of challenges in weighing the value of using these machine learning models um, for known unknowns and our ability to cal um, determine their credibility is, is a large grand challenge problem that the community is still working out. But there's ways in which we can do this in a defensible and um, interpretable way. So I'm going to punch you here real quick again and just say, you know, I said our models are much more complicated than SIR. Here's an example, right? So we get into the disease dynamics, quarantine, isolation, vaccinations, and I'm starting to explode this and I'm not even hitting uh, stratification of age dependency or comorbidity dependencies. This is just quarantine and vaccinations. Uh, one of the things we do is we pull in a network representation for a population so that we can get better fidelity about the contact rates, right? Um, our dynamics up here assumes uniform mixing. A network can prioritize transmission based on your socialization network. This one is not fully agent-based. This is a, an abstraction away from that, but it still gra provides greater fidelity than um, our compartmental models in that regard. The other nice part is because you're using a network, you can actually take real world data, census data, empirical contact data information to infer a network structure that is a representative um, realization of different communities. So this gives a summary of how those communities, we can do age stratification, we can get household stratification analysis in place so that we can understand how the disease is spreading based on different characterizations of a, a particular population, which allows us to get to higher fidelity models, which this is a summary of showing just how variable those networks are. We go from higher age, which is a lower connected community to lower age, higher connective communities, and one of the things we want to do is use a universal approximation to that, that stochastic high fidelity model. So I'm not going to use the vaccines here. I'm just going to look at the disease dynamics. ARM is still, the stochastic model is still capturing quarantine. It's still capturing all this other great rich information, the transmission through network structures, stochastic disease progressions, um, all these things that my model doesn't capture. But I'm going to throw in this quarantine, just one, one state, just like MIT did in the simpler model, and see what can happen. Even if I take a very, very loose approximation for initialization of what the compartmental model looks like, my UDE model can snap it into place by capturing that model form error correction. So I'm getting to a place in which I have a surrogate for that higher fidelity model that allows me to not only learn that correction, but you'll see here in green, we shift the parameters to match that as well. If you don't want the parameters to shift, you can fix them or you put a strong prior on it, right? But if you're not quite sure about that parameter, you can let it shift as you're allowing for this model form error correction. And now I have a surrogate that gives me a hierarchical approach to, to calibration. So this is just a summary of how we're approaching this now. There's a lot of complexities that are still going to go into a UDE surrogate for agent-based models that has a variety of analysis workflows that have to start with sensitivity analysis, learning the model form error corrections as a surrogate, and then turning around and asking the real world what that is. 
Um, but these are, this is how we're starting to structure in a, a way in which we can trust how those models are being used, because I know the design of the higher fidelity model. So to wrap up, and I'm sorry I didn't leave time at the end um, to chat too much, but Greg, thank you so much for so many engaging conversations along the way. Um, we just want to reemphasize, right? Uh, we have a responsibility to ensure that we have a responsible use of these machine learned models for national security purposes. We have a deep technical basis of BMV that we can build off of um, the shoulders of giants. And there's a lot of wide spanning adoption, but yet the level of adoption is still going to be restricted by our ability to have these, these core technical um, understanding of, of these models in this context. So I'm just going to say that when, when the benefits of using SciML, we want to just keep asking these questions. What am I weighing? What are the risks I'm assuming by bringing this in? And why is that the right thing to do for this application context? The answer is still probably yes, and sometimes it's no. Well, yeah, thank you very much, Aaron. Um, yeah, Roy, you had a question? Yeah, uh, so thanks, Aaron. It was very interesting. Hey, I got a question about uh, transfer learning. If you mm -hmm. train your model on a, like from what I understood, like like the examples you showed, all the data relates to like a specific uh, country or or area. But mm -hmm. how much mm -hmm. do you transfer, you know, if you trained it on 10 different countries, how do you move on to the 11? So that's interesting, right? Um, and I think this gets to the same question I want to, I want to bridge it with a question Greg asked earlier, because when I hear transfer learning and what we're doing, I think foundational models, right, not in the large language model context, but there's there's this core um, representation that you preserve that keeps you 85% of the way there. And then you're just learning this this correction for the novelty of the new new region, new phenomenon that you're tackling. So um, that's, for me, that's still an open question that I'd like to explore because right now we're preserving the classic compartmental model to as that core foundation, if you will, um, to, to reuse that term. And, and then there's still gonna be this, how much of that neural network has its own foundational, like how many layers maybe I, I freeze and I only have to train one last layer for a new region, right? I think there's gonna be layers of, of how much we preserve in our knowledge-based mechanistic model versus the foundational layers that we preserve that are, say, consistent across regions, but we need. And then there's the, the transfer layers that we just train um, for those correction terms. Thanks. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, and if I can make take this farther, this is completely software engineer speak. Um, I'm hearing a programming model. I'm hearing that you have a simulation you wrote that describes your dynamics, and you say in the code, like you would have said, this is an integer, you would say, I'm not sure about this, or mm -hmm. this term, try a few more transformers right before this term, because I'm not sure if the data coming in from the previous term to this term is quite right. Maybe it should be times five or something. So it's, to what extent are you in a position to start developing or using such programming models where it seems like you do know what you know and you mm -hmm. have suspicions about what you don't know? Yeah, I think this is... Um, and that gets, it gets back to another point we had earlier, right? How much do you trust what you know? And how much do you do you open it up to be informed by the data, right? That's that's the that's the balance of scientific machine learning, right? It's also the debate with the broader machine learning community. Like, don't inject your principles, let the data tell you what's going on. There's a lot of people that sit in various camps of of what what we trust, right? Um, but you know, I'll also add, not but like that's real. Um, I'll also add to that and just emphasize and going back from the credibility discussion we started with, just be transparent and honest about what those core assumptions are and where you're allowing for that open opportunity for the data to change it and how you're going to allow it to change it. And can you back that out to, to relating it to the original principles that you're, you're giving up, right? You're saying, well, this might, we might have to re-question this, this baseline, um, assumption that we have trusted for decades mm -hmm. that's a hard and dangerous thing to do too <laughs> um 
And and when you want to do that and just being transparent and honest about it through that that credibility analysis and that documentation and communication with the community of practice. Um, I think those are the things that we just need to make sure that we're we're open and and consistent about. Um, because at the end of the day, we this trade-off between what we think we know and what we know and what we're allowing the data to tell us is always subjective to some assumption somewhere along the way. Right. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for, for inviting me again. I'll switch this over just before the recording ends um, <laughs> so that the contact information is there. And right. um, yeah, thank you. Have a great day. You too. Bye.